So bird genetics, um, I immediately changed this slide to turkey genetics. I mean, I understand that turkeys are birds, but I'm only going to talk about turkey genetics today, not other birds, okay? Just, just to clear things up. Somebody once told me that you should always start a presentation with uh, a funny joke or an anecdote or a story. Um, and in this case, I think the truth is stranger than fiction. So I'm going to show you something I came across in the news yesterday. This is a carrot made out of meat in a total opposite to the burgers made out of vegetables. Uh, <laughs> They are now doing, uh, doing this just to spite those people. And it came up even on the, the CNN Business News. And I'm going to let you watch this video because it is pretty priceless and involves us. So instead of vegetables, vegetables, right? Because they're made out of meat. Merit makes sense, right? Meat, carrot. This is the best part. It's made out of turkey. <laughs> Still in the uh, test phase, very much so. But uh, this is put forward by Arby's, uh, who has very much refused to do the plant-based meat proteins uh, on their menu. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and this is very much kind of in spite of uh, of this movement. So yeah, like I said, this was this was wild. I came across this not on you know Facebook, not on social media, but CNN Business. So this is out there in the news promoting the use of, of turkey meat. So that's my introductory story. But back to the main topic. So turkey genetics, where is it now? Uh, and I don't know how many people have ever seen kind of like a genetics update from a primary breeder, be it myself or, or Paige or, or Jihad or in the past Ben or Nico. But my role is to, to run the R&D program and therefore the genetics program for hybrid turkeys. And this is something that the where is it now, what we would typically present to a grower group or, or a breeder group uh, to show them what we're doing uh, with the turkey breeding program. So if we look at the evolution of turkey breeding, uh, really turkeys in comparison to some of the other livestock species have only been under selection for a relatively short period of time. Uh, if you look at chickens, if you look at pigs, if you look at cattle, you, know, you can find hieroglyphs in ancient Egypt with those, those animals on them where you won't find turkeys is on those same hieroglyphs, right? We've only started breeding turkeys seriously under selection since kind of like the 1960s, it says here, or maybe a little bit before that, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. They started with that wild type turkey with the brown feathers, and of course it's moved on over the years to that large, large broad breast red white turkey that we have today. So that's where we came from. In the 60s and 70s, uh, instead of just doing physical selection, looking at the prettiest, the biggest birds, they started doing actual index selection where you do kind of multiple trait measurements. Not only are you looking at a nice looking bird, you'd weigh body weight, you might do some feed conversion and combine them and get a single score for a turkey and then, and then take the best one. Moving on to kind of the 1980s up until the 2010s or even the 2000s era, you have selection on, on breeding values. So this is the introduction of Henderson's mixed model equations, uh, and these were used to take more information into account when you're picking the best turkey. So instead of you know, looking at a good turkey and then taking some body weights, now information you added to the pile was the family history. So you have a pedigree for the first time ever. And that pedigree information allows you to make more accurate selections on these animals. <clears throat> so this is what we've been doing for the last kind of 20 or 30 years. If you look at the era we're in now, kind of the 2010s to the, to the 2020s, or, or where we're going to get to, we're now in the era of genomic selection. So I think all major turkey breeders, so ourselves as well as Avigen, are selecting animals using genomic breeding values. So this is where you take a sample of blood, uh, you send it to a lab, and they bring you back some, some DNA markers that you can correlate to performances. So now, instead of, you know, 60s where we said, okay, this bird is pretty, we moved on to multiple trait, then we moved on to pedigree and family information. Now we're actually looking at the DNA level of these individual animals, as well as all these other prongs to select the best animal. What this means is that the rate of genetic gain from, say, what we were doing in 1960 to today has increased multiple, multiple fold. So we're able to move turkeys in the direction we want them to much faster than we have been in the past. What's next? That's kind of the second half of this presentation, but I'll go into what we're doing right now. So if I look at a turkey breeding program, uh, and it would be the similar in, in any kind of primary breeder, you start with eggs, they go to a pedigree hatchery, these birds are hatched individually and wing banded and barcoded so you know who they are, who their parents were, who their grandparents were. And then they're placed on rearing farms and we start to measure traits on them. In our program we have two kind of 
streams where we get information from animals. The first one would be phenotypes, so phenotypes being physical characteristics of animals or performance traits, so body weights. In our program, a male turkey is weighed at 12 weeks, at 20 weeks, at 24 weeks, so three body weights on every single individual male. The hens would be weighed at 14 weeks, 18 weeks, and lighting, so three body weights on every individual female. And that all goes back into the database that we can use to calculate breeding values. They're also giving a walking ability, so any turkey that comes through our program at 18 or 20 weeks of age, we have our head of physical selection sit down behind them, they walk 10 or 20 feet, and they get an aggregate score based on their pitch, balance, structure, etc. So that's how that works. And then the animals that don't make it through to be selection candidates, they get sent off to the plant for breast meat yield. Now we don't have breast meat yield measurements on live animals because to get the real trait you have to cut up the individual and therefore they're no longer usable in the breeding program. We also do feed efficiency testing. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but this has evolved in the last five to 10 years as well. The second arm kind of of the breeding program is looking at genotypes. So this didn't exist you know, pre-2015, 2016 in the turkey industry, but now it's pretty widespread. So we do DNA testing on individuals, we get solutions back on their SNP markers, and it all kind of goes into our central database. So we combine all these things that we now have. We have DNA, we have phenotypes, we have pedigree history, uh, et cetera, and we calculate breeding values. So breeding values are a representation of how you will do in the subsequent generations. So if you have a really good breeding value, we want to use you because we know that your progeny is going to be better than the progeny of some of the other animals in the system. And that's how we're selecting the best animals. Uh, I say we, that's how I'm selecting the best animals. Or my counterpart page for AvaGym will be doing that. Uh, and then you end up with kind of the best hens and toms in your program. You're keeping maybe 1% of the toms and maybe 5 to 10% of the hens. That's our kind of selection pressure threshold. And then they're mated and they get moved to the lay barn and it, and it all kind of starts over again. So it's very cyclical and that's how that genetic progress moves through the years. What makes it so important to do a good job kind of at the peer line level, if we look at what we call kind of the breeding pyramid, this is where, where I'm working here in Turkey Pure Lines. We select kind of one hen. What does that mean? It means this hen might produce, let's say, 40 GPs. These GPs might produce 1,600 parent stock, uh, and you end up with you know, 120,000-ish commercial poults, yielding something like 3.8 million pounds of turkey, which means that if we do a bad job here, this whole industry is impacted all the way down the chain. So we take it very seriously to make sure that we pick this right animal every time because uh, it can have a huge impact downstream. What are we selecting for in a breeding program? So modern turkey genetics really is, is pretty much a balanced breeding approach. In the past, it was heavily focused on body weight, heavily focused on, say, feed conversion. Now we have a lot of health and welfare traits in the breeding program, as well as reproductive traits. Of course, this growth, average daily gain, body weight, whatever you want to call it, is still very important because that's what people are getting paid on, uh, as well as feed efficiency and, and, of course, yield. Not only breast meat yield, but also something that's very important right now, especially is thigh meat yield given where the swine industry is going uh, and what the value of dark meat is doing out there in the industry. Okay? So all those things are in the breeding program in what we call a balanced approach. So at the pure line level, so at the pedigree farm, we have multiple pure lines, multiple male lines, multiple female lines, uh, and they are all kind of up here, and we produce them, reproduce them together, and we do the genetic improvement at this level. The way that gets disseminated through the industry uh, is through kind of GPs, and then you end up with the first crossbreds, which are parent stocks. So if you have a parent stock female, it's a two-way cross. If you have a parent stock male, it might also be a two-way cross. And then this commercial final product is a four-way cross between kind of these pure lines up here. Of course, if you change the pure lines that are involved in some of these matings, you can end up with very different kind of commercial final products. Of course, the most widely known one in North America is probably the converter, uh, at least from us. But if you change some of those matings with different pure lines, uh, you end up with very kind of different commercial final products. So in Western Europe, we have Grade Maker, which is more for the medium market. Uh, we also have the Optima, which is kind of in between the converter uh, and the grade maker, fits well uh, in the Canadian market actually. And then we have this XL, which is a, a really, really kind of our, our biggest offering at the moment, and that's mostly grown in Eastern Europe and Poland. Uh, of course, you can also make other big changes. If you change the mail to something, you know, a little bit more niche product-ish, you can end up with some of these, these great little products like the Orlop Bronze, the Artisan Gold, and the Mini Classic. So the color gene in, in turkeys is dominant. So if you have a male who is pure line bronze, all the progeny from that mating are going to be bronze turkeys. So in fact, a white turkey is, is a recessive gene in, in a breeding program. So these are some of our niche products that we offer. 
How do we improve some of those traits in the breeding program? Uh, one of them I mentioned is kind of, you know, feeding stations or next generation feeding systems. And this is something that turkeys have kind of copy pasted from other breeding programs. So we were a little bit slow to the get go on this, but they come from the grow safe system in pigs, the fire feeders in pigs, uh, and they have a lot of things in other animal breeding programs to individually measure feed intake. Of course, this is a lot easier on big animals, and that's because the scale is totally different. If you have to measure individual feed intake on a thousand turkeys, it's considerably harder than measuring individual feed intake on 10 hogs. It's, it's, it's just a different level, although it's the same technology. So we scaled this technology up. Now every bird here in the feeding station would be RFID wing banded. Uh, here you can see an antenna. They're eating out of a regular type feed hopper that sits on a scale. So the bird will walk in, the computer knows when the bird came in, knows how much feed was in the hopper when it got there, and then it measures when the bird leaves and how much feed is in the hopper again. You take the difference between those two uh, weight measurements and that's the feed intake for that meal. It sounds like a pretty straightforward process, but it's um, logistically a little bit hard to do in a, in a turkey barn with a thousand birds or so. But with the improvements that we have in technology, you know, we've got these dustproof cases. Uh, it's all connected to the internet now in our barns. And of course, there's some nice touchscreen uh, interfaces for the users. And it'll send you an email if feed hoppers are getting low or a text message if one of them has gone offline because a turkey pecked it, you have to go plug it back in, something like that. So it has become more practical uh, over the time. What does the data look like? So here you can see that our, our mail line test lasts 35 days. So they're on test for, for five weeks. Uh, and you get these kind of... Uh, kind of these intake curves. So you can see turkeys, there's kind of a lot of variation in feed intake. You know, some days they might eat quite a bit, the next day they might be tired and not quite eat the same and, and so on and so forth. So you end up with this great data um, on every single bird uh, kind of in the test system. And then we just sum that feed intake up uh, and here you get the total feed intake over that period. The birds are also weighed over that period and then you look at the ratio between intake and body weight gain and you end up with your feed conversion ratio or your residual feed intake if that's what you're calculating. Okay. What's interesting is, in addition to just the average um, intake that you get, you also get these curves. So you can see that individual A here in the light blue kind of ate a lot more feed at the start and then plateaued off. And this other one here started a little bit slower and then tailed off at the end. So although they ended up quite similar on their intake, they got there in different ways. And how they got there is going to have an impact on what their performance is in body weight and feed conversion ratio and in leg strength. If you have an underdeveloped bird and it puts on a ton of weight, at the wrong time while its legs are still developing, it's gonna have a poor walking score at 20 weeks than say a bird that had a little bit slower of a growth while it was developing and setting those bones and then piled on the weight after. So these are the things that we're starting to look at in, in, our, in our breeding program. Okay. In addition, we're also collecting this great feeding behavior data. So we know uh, kind of at the beginning of the day when the lights turn on that the, the birds pile into the feeders and they eat a lot. Midday, there's a bit of a siesta and then they know that the lights are gonna get turned off at the end of the day so they get back in there and fill their stomachs before the lights go out. So this now is in, the, in our database. We know where, you know, kind of how much, how long, how often these birds are eating. And you can start to see actually the social effects of dominance of the turkeys. So the more desirable feeders, which are in the safe zone in the barn, so they're kind of in the middle bank, are, are where kind of the, the bigger turkeys end up eating. And the smaller ones who are lower on, say, the pecking order are kind of out towards the edges in terms of where they're eating and, and when they're eating. So it's, it's very interesting there. Also something that we're looking at selecting on in terms of its correlation with aggression in our breeding program. If we look at genomics, like I said now, modern turkey breeding programs are all uh, including SNP selections in their uh, analysis. So what is a SNP? A SNP is kind of a single nucleotide polymorphism, which is a complicated way of saying it's a difference in, in your genome. So in the human genome, as much as in the turkey genome, there is a ton of conserved sequences. Everybody has the same genetic profile for creating red blood cells. Okay, that's, that's what keeps us all alive and keeps us well exception of people with sickle cell anemia, so I, but there's exceptions to every rule, right? So we're not interested in that. What we're interested in is the tiny differences in your genome which give you a boost in performance or can have a negative impact on your performance. So we did some pre-competitive stuff with the USDA as well as Avigen turkeys to develop this turkey SNP chip. It was a 750,000 SNPs that had differences between individuals in turkey populations. We then went our own ways and we developed our own SNP chip reflective of our turkey genetic populations of 65,000 SNPs. And these SNPs showed correlated impacts on traits like feed conversion, livability, body weight, uh, et cetera. So we implemented that into our breeding program, kind of started early 2016. Uh, and since kind of the summer of 2017, all the lines that make up our commercial products are under this uh, genomic selection program, which adds a lot of information to our system. So it's not helping us go any faster. 
really we're moving turkey breeding as fast as we can. As soon as they become sexually mature, we're mating them and we move on with the program. So it's not helping us here. It's not giving us any more genetic variability. Our populations are our populations. We're not bringing in outside genes from outside species or outside turkey populations. And the selection intensity remains pretty much as high as possible, 1% in the males and 5 to 10 in the females. But what it does is give us a pile more of accuracy in terms of our selection. We're no longer inferring what the DNA sequence is based on your phenotypic performance. We know what the DNA tells us about your phenotypic performance. And therefore, we have a higher accuracy in terms of making the selection decisions for the next generations. Like I said, we've moved now from this genetic situation where we had phenotypes and pedigree information to get estimated breeding values uh, to adding that third prong, and that's really genotypes. Uh, and then we get uh, GBLUP, uh, which leads us to you know, GEBVs, or genomic estimated breeding values, and we get this genetic improvement somewhere around 10%. So we can do 10% more in a year than we used to be able to do in a year. Right? So this is kind of what a modern turkey breeding program looks like. What does that mean in terms of performance improvements in traits ever from year to year? It depends a lot on kind of the direction you're going with your lines, but you can see something up to, you know, a pound of body weight difference one year to the next or one generation to the next in terms of a tom at 20 weeks of age and improvements in walking ability, uh, breast meat yield, and feed conversion. Uh, every year we're, we're able to do this. Uh, this is a slide that's a few years old, but I think it gives a good visual representation of what these modern, modern turkey breeding programs have been able to do since kind of the mid-60s to the mid-2000s. Uh, and this is from a paper of Havenstein, who's a very famous turkey researcher. But you can see what, what selection has done in terms of body weight improvements uh, at 112 days and 196 days, and, and in terms of yields. So here you can see this would have been the breast meat yield in, in 1966, and then in 2003, that's a huge improvement. And we're again, you know, another 15 years into the future uh, from this slide. So that's a huge difference that these breeding programs have made over the course of the last 50 or 60 years. So that's really kind of what a modern turkey breeding program looks like, or where we are today in terms of turkey genetics. If I talk about where is it going, uh, there's a lot of speculation there, so please understand that this is mostly speculation, but uh, uh, it's at least an educated guesstimate of, of what's going to happen in the future. So I said kind of what's coming next in this next era in 2020 and beyond is really going to be the application of new technologies. Genetics doesn't fundamentally change overnight uh, with kind of one exception, which we'll talk about at the end. But all these new technologies are what we're going to use to drive the breeding programs even faster than we have in the past. One of them is in-depth genomic data. So right now we're using that genomic data we have to select better on the traits that are currently there. But what we can do is also look at some kind of lethal SNP combinations. So there are genes that are detrimental to turkey growth and turkey viability that are out there floating around in the population, much like there are in human populations. And you put two of the wrong people together, and you end up in a situation where you have you know, progeny that's, that's, not, uh, that, that's not alive or they, they can't have children uh, due to their genetic combination. And that exists in turkeys as well. So let's say, for example, that we have two carriers. So blue would be a good gene, red would be a bad gene. The odds of you having the, the different percentages of genetic makeup are here. There's a 25% chance that you could be free of those negative genes. Uh, you can also have a 50% chance that, again, the progeny is a carrier. And then you have this lethal combination. And this lethal combination, of course, wouldn't exist in your population. So you know, based on the statistics behind this, that if you make two carrier matings like this, you should have these genes then out there in the wild if they weren't lethal. So what we did was identify uh, a bunch of different uh, positions on chromosomes where there were some of these lethal alleles, and then we went out and looked in our turkey populations based on these genomics to see what was in there. Uh, of course, we can project that we should have 25% of these matings have these, these lethal genes in them, uh, so they should be in the population, and what we found is that, in fact, these combinations here, you can see the zeros, did not exist in the population that we were genotyping, which tells us that the combination of these genes leads to either embryonic mortality, infertility, or death at an early stage before we sample these animals. So while these should be in the population, they're not. And, that, and because of that, we've labeled them you know, lethal genes or carrier genes. So the next step in this project is to start looking more in depth through all of our turkey pedigree lines and slowly eliminate these carriers. Uh, and that way, you could back calculate the improvements kind of in hatchability that you might see. And the projected improvement in hatchability from this project that we saw in one particular line was about 3 quarters of a percent. You know, that's not bumping you up from 86% hatchability to 90 or 95%, but three quarters of percent over, you know, let's say a million turkey eggs, that, that makes a big difference. 
So this is the kind of stuff that will be more and more done, I think, in the, in the future of turkey breeding programs that look that deep dive into genes and start removing these really negative or lethal ones that we see in the population. The next focus, I think, will be uh, breast meat yield, uh, and that goes hand in hand with breast meat quality. Uh, or, or regular meat quality. Not a huge concern in the turkey industry at the moment, but if you look at what happened in the broiler industry, they had a huge crisis of woody breast and white striping. Uh, and so what we need to do is, is make sure we keep on top of that. And we've started recording this stuff in our database now, so really starting to keep track, not selecting for it yet, but keeping a pulse on what's going on in the genetic lines. So this is, uh, we send 500 birds every week for, for cut up, so we have breast meat yield and we have full parts cut ups on these animals. We're taking color, so using LAB meters at cut and 24 hours post, pH at cut and 24 hours post, and then you have here, I don't know if you can see it, this is a GoPro, and at the same time that we're weighing the breast lobes, we're also taking an image of those uh, to identify the white striping. Of course, we don't want to be counting number of white stripes and, and thickness by hand, so we started a project with the University of Guelph School of Engineering where they're using machine learning algorithms to count and quantify the white stripes from, from all these images. So in the past, we might have an army of undergraduate or, or graduate students counting these things and putting them in the database. Now we just send the images to the, to the computer engineering people uh, and they give us a score back, say, okay, this animal had a score of three, it had many white stripes, and they had an average thickness of uh, I don't know how many millimeters. So this is what we're doing with that. The other step is to do kind of some uh, live imaging off the line. So this is very popular in, I shouldn't say popular, very effective in kind of pig breeding programs and at pig plants and less so in turkeys, but I think it's moving this direction. So here you can see, turn that down. Here you can see this is live uh, off, the, off the plant line. And this here is basically the same kind of setup. There's a camera, a bright light, a bright light and a black mat in behind. And we're taking constant video of these animals as they go by. And then we pull the images out of the video uh, and this is, you can see these are pedigree birds, they've got wing bands on them. And this way we can track which families have more condemnations than other families and start to get a handle on that from a genetic standpoint. So this is kind of what the raw video looks like. This is the enhanced still image. And from that, we've done some work with Morel Poultry and we're involved in a project with them uh, in terms of, again, having the computer identify kind of the, the different parts where the condemnations are happening. And eventually, once the database is large enough, you can infer yield percentages on the different cut-up pieces for these animals um, going forward with the idea that instead of doing it on 500 animals, you might be able to do it on thousands of animals uh, because it takes less labor. If I look at other novel technologies for, for novel phenotypes, uh, we end up in ways to kind of assess leg strength and walking ability and how well those animals are handling themselves. So this is one project we looked at and it was kind of utilization of accelerometers. So here you can see on each of these tom turkeys, we've put accelerometers on each leg uh, and you're able to look at, uh, again, kind of how they perform in, in 3D space so on an XYZ plane, how those monitors are turning. Uh, and that's kind of the data that you have here. And then again, we use some quick computer algorithms to uh, look the correlation with the scores from the accelerometers and the walking scores that we got from our traditional selection methods. Uh, and the computer did a pretty good job in most of these instances in terms of correlating the accelerometers with the walking score. So it shows that it could be done. The issue with this trial was, of course, that you have to put accelerometers on turkeys, and anyone who's handled a tom turkey at 20 weeks knows that that's not super practical. So not something we're going to go ahead with, but at least it showed that we could do it. So the next step in this project was to find a more practical way to do this. And so we came up with this kind of force plate technology. Now, a force plate basically looks like a huge scale. What it does, though, is measure kind of the pressure sensors of when you push on it. So if anybody's ever been to, like, the foot doctor or stood on the Dr. Scholl's kind of thing, and it shows where the pressure is of your feet while you're doing this, this is kind of this uh, on steroids. So it's a big way of monitoring the pressure that the turkeys put one leg on the other uh, as they're walking. So here is kind of the experimental setup. Uh, and at the same time, the, the idea would be to pick up the body weight of this animal as it walks over the force plate. So twofold, we're looking for a walking score and, and, and body weight. So this is our traditional kind of walking selection, walk the bird down an alleyway. What we did here was dig down to the concrete floor, put the force plate under, and then just pile the litter back on top of it and walk the turkeys over it. What we ended up with was a pile of pile of data from the force plate and also our walking scores from our selectors and our body weights from our traditional scale measurements. So this is kind of the output that you get. Uh, it's, it's kind of meaningless if you don't know what it is, but lots and lots of data. And, and what do you do with lots and lots of data when you're an animal breeding company? Well, 
you outsource it to students and engineers to try and deal with it. So this is a short kind of video that they came up with. Um, and it was a hackathon that was run out of a university in, uh, in the Netherlands looking at kind of an outside in approach. So instead of animal breeders looking at it and thinking in our traditional way, we said, okay, hey, hire some engineering and mathematics students to look at it and see what they can come up with. See how close they can get at making the force plate data correlate with our body weight data and our walking score data. So at the end of all that, they did, they did the four days. They didn't get it perfect. But what they were able to do was give us uh, feedback in terms of body weights versus the body weights that we had calculated on those animals. And they were within uh, about 400 grams, so within about a pound. Uh, based on the force plate, just walking over, not picking up the turkey. And us as a genetics company, we went, great, that sounds awesome. Not quite accurate enough for a breeding program, but downstream applications where you might be doing PS selections uh, on body weight, uh, you know, on thousands and thousands of animals, this might be a good way to relieve some of that stress on the employees as well as stress on the turkeys. Instead of picking them up and holding them and weighing them, anyone who's ever held a tom turkey it shakes like hell, right? Instead of that, which is hard on the person and the bird, you can have them walk over it, and the hope would be that the scale would be able to calculate in the background and, and automatically just kind of tell you what that body weight is, accurate within a pound, which might be good enough uh, you know, in a downstream pipeline to make those decisions. So still in the works, but that's kind of you know, where we're going. The other part is downstream data collection. So the way that traditionally things have gone in the, in the pure line or the pedigree primary breeder world are that, again, I showed you this multiplication table, right? And we're doing all the genetic improvement up here and we're measuring traits up here, which is great. It's small numbers. Uh, we can control it ourselves in-house. We make those measurements uh, and we do the genetic improvement here. The issue is that uh, most people don't care what the body weight is of one of my pure lines on pedigree. What they care about is what the body weight is of this commercial poll at 20 weeks or at slaughter age, right? So this is where success is measured in the industry uh, in terms of pounds of total output and in terms of you know, commercial poll performance, be it disease resistance, body weight, feed conversion, breast meat yield, thigh meat yield, yada, yada. So the problem here is that you know, the correlation between the traits that I measure at pedigree and the traits in the commercial poll is not one meaning that we are leaving some genetic improvement on the table when we do selections up here based on these traits and the traits that are down here. Now the correlation is also you know, not less than 0.5, it's still relatively high, but imagine if the correlation was one, how much better we could do in terms of genetic improvement year over year. And because of that, I think the primary breeder model is kind of going to be turned on its head in the, in the future uh, when we get the ability to measure large amounts of data. And really what we want to do is measure the traits in the commercial pulse and the commercial outputs and then relay those back to the genetic improvement, right? And here you have that R squared equals one. So you're really measuring the trait exactly where you want it to be and exactly what it is, and then doing the genetic improvement at the pure line level. The issue here is, of course, this pyramid, being that here I might have to measure one hen. Uh, in parent stock, I might have to measure you know, thousands and thousands of hens. And if you blow that up again to the commercial level to look at breast meat yield, you're talking you know, millions and millions. But that's really the best way to, to do things. And the way that we're going to be able to do that in the future is high throughput phenotyping, which is really a way of saying we need to automatically collect all this data on an individual basis and link it back into the breeding program uh, with a very 
not hands-on approach, right? Because I don't know about you guys, but there's not a whole lot of labor out there in the industry that wants to pick eggs or weigh turkeys or what have you. The solution to this is going to be kind of through technology. And this is an example I want to show you of an egg picking robot that was developed in Germany. Uh, it's a bit of a long video, so I might skip halfway through, but I have no idea what ISAM stands for. So this is the test facility where they're currently running it. But you'll see here trap nested hens, which are then without human interaction, pushed off the nest, the egg is picked up, the egg is weighed, uh, and the egg is put on a tray. So I'll let you guys watch this. So it's kind of got two arms as you can see. The one that's in the lead is pushing the hens off and the one that follows behind is the one that's picking up the egg. Uh, and you have, yeah, so here's the egg picking up. Then it's putting it on here, it weighs it, it cleans off the debris a little bit, and then the next robotic arm is putting it straight onto the tray. You hear the sound here, they've had to slow it down into slow motion because this robot works so fast. So here's the, the trap nest, and here you can see the hen is pushed out. You can see the egg in the nest, and if you look on the computer, the computer screen briefly, you can see the vision technology that they're using to identify the egg. I think it'll flash up here. Boom. See that green ball? It identified where the egg was in the nest, and it sent the robot down to go get it. And then it picks it up again, and it trays it. So. The advantage for a primary breeder is that you could then get data on egg production from PS hens on a massive scale if people were to put these in their barns. The advantage for, let's say, a multiplier is that guess who doesn't call in sick on Monday mornings? The egg robot. Guess who doesn't go home at 5 o'clock every day? The egg robot. So the first few flocks that they've done, they said they've increased the production by hundreds of eggs simply because the hens can always go in the nest when the lights are on and they can always get pushed off and collect the eggs. Um, while the lights are on. Whereas typically you might have someone who goes home, right? Yeah. So it's quite the interesting function. You can see here, yeah, it trays them on. These are the Petersheim trays, I believe. And then it pushes them all the way down to like a cart at the end uh, and stacks them all up. When we asked what the price was, they said, we'll get back to you. <laughs> Which is a polite way of saying, if you have to ask, you can't afford it. Um, but if enough people band together and, and really start buying them, I imagine that the price would come down. But certainly this is, I think, probably the future of animal production from both a primary breeder as well as, say, a production standpoint. Now the, the last topic I want to I touch on is GMOs and gene editing. Uh, and this is probably a subject I get the most questions on, either at the bar or outside or in trucks driving around. People don't seem to want to be very open about it, but this is a very, very serious subject in our industry. And it's, it's interesting to see where we are right now and, and where we're going. So where are we in the animal breeding sector? Has anybody heard of the aqua bounty salmon? This is the first transgenic animal that was approved by the FDA for human consumption. So they started on this process in 1989, uh, and they got approved in, uh, I think, 2015 or 2016 to be able to sell it. So it took them, I don't know, how's my math, 25 years in order to get it uh, out into the industry, which took a lot of lobbying uh, and a lot of uh, government um, tiptoeing around. Now, the aqua bounty salmon uh, is uh, an insertion of genes from other species. So there is a gene in there from the Chinook salmon, which is the biggest type of salmon, as well as an ocean pout, um, which grows year round uh, in very, very cold water. The issue with regular kind of Atlantic salmon is that they only grow in the spring, summer when it's warm. So they put these two genes in there, and now they grow year round. So you can see that these two fish, this is the non-transgenic one here in the front and the transgenic one in the back, are the exact same age. The difference being that the transgenic one was able to grow year round all the time. So that's kind of where the, the aquaculture industry is. Um, and it's worthwhile to note this was a transgenic fish. So what that means is you're inserting genes from one species into another. So like I said, they took from those other two fish species, put it into the, to the salmon. Whereas cisgenic really refers to inserting genes from a same species into a subpopulation or another population. And I like to think about it like this graphic. 
So transgenic is taking, you know, corn genes or bacteria genes and putting them into an apple, where cisgenic is taking an apple gene from, let's say, Granny Smith and putting it into a gala, right? It's apples to apples, whereas the other one is, you know, oranges to apples, if you want to think about those as the differences. Now, what's different than in gene editing is, uh, is something that I think this video will explain. So it's not uh, gene insertion, it's not, you know, transgenics, it's not GMO, but it really is something different. So that's, that's the subtle difference in, in gene editing versus GMOs, is you're really looking at going in and, and removing bad parts of genes as opposed to taking you know, really great parts from other animals and inserting them into your species. A great example of this uh, is something that was done in, in 2015 already, and these were gene-edited pigs uh, to protect from PERS, or uh, porcine respiratory reproductive syndrome virus. So this has a huge impact on the hog industry uh, in terms of wiping out small piglets. What they did here in this paper was go in and not insert genes uh, you know, from other species. What they did was they removed the binding site for this virus from the pig genome. So viruses have binding sites or, or different mechanisms to get into uh, hosts and then reproduce. And what they did was simply cut it out of the pig genome and make a PERS resistant pig. Okay? So this was back in 2015. Uh, and if you look here who the uh, corresponding affiliations and authors are, you'll see Genus PIC. Genus PIC is one of the biggest pig breeding companies in, in North America, uh, let alone globally. And in addition, what they did, uh, despite you know, maybe fear of public backlash, was they posted this on their website for immediate release. Again, this is now you know, almost four years ago. Genus tackles major, major pig disease with breakthrough technology. So they said, hey, we did this, we used gene editing, but guess what? It's for the right reasons. It wasn't to make more money through yield. It wasn't to make more money through feed efficiency. It was really for animal welfare reasons, right? Nobody wants to see thousands and thousands of piglets dying from this disease. We went in, we made a small deletion of a binding site, and it has bettered the animal welfare of our industry. Not only that, but they, you know, they put their phone numbers on here. They said, hey, you want to talk about it, call us. And this is the right way to do things, I think. Right? So gene editing is not going to get approval in the greater public section or, or even, even be the government for you know, uh, the positivity of people's bank statements. Where it's going to gain acceptance is let's say in our industry, if you could remove the binding site for, let's say, avian influenza, we might have a population that shows resistance or is resistant to you know, avian influenza. And we all remember what happened a few years ago in our industry where we were killing hundreds of thousands of turkeys, and, and I think there was some public outcry there. And if we could do a better job in terms of a genetic company to providing an animal that is resistant to that, I think that's the way we're going to get buy-in uh, and legislative clarity for these things. So other species that have kind of been successfully gene edited in the academic world, mice, fish, sheep, pigs, you know, monkeys. I wrote humans dot, dot, dot. We've now seen that uh, they edited the first pair of humans in China to have resistance to HIV. And this was the same way that Genus went about it. They went and removed the binding site. So uh, a Chinese researcher did this kind of under the table uh, and was able to make uh, HIV resistant humans um, using this technique. Uh, morally acceptable? Uh, of course not, uh, and I think he was kind of banned from a lot of things. But the issue is the technology is very plentiful and very cheap, so a lot of people with a small amount of knowledge can kind of go out and do these things. So as long as you have a lab uh, and you can order these kind of DNA pieces um, off the internet, really. 
Another one that's been edited are our friends uh, in chickens. Of course, they've been using this, this CRISPR-Cas9 system as well. And I can only imagine that it's a short period of time until somebody uh, is doing it in turkeys, at least on an academic or, or research basis. Okay. So that's kind of the last subject I wanted to cover with you. Uh, it maybe is a little bit murkier than, than gives clarity in terms of the gene editing, but yeah, we'll see what happens, you know, 2020 and beyond uh, in, the, in the future. So genetics, where it is, where is it going? Modern turkey genetic programs, you know, I think we're on the frontier of animal breeding. Uh, if you look at either ourselves or Avagen, we're really doing a, a pretty good job in terms of using all the technologies that are out there to make a better turkey every year. Uh, and if I think about where it is going, you know, turkey genetics has a bright and exciting future. We're going to take all these technologies that are out there, we're going to apply them to our breeding program, gather data from downstream, and really improve, you know, body weights, feed conversions, livability, uh, and yields uh, for many, many years to come. So with that, uh, thanks very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions either in here or at the bar. Yes. You had that slide with the, the zero line with the number one on top. Of the yep. And then how long does it take before you see it? When we make progress in the pure lines, it typically takes three to four years to show the improvements in the commercial populations, just to get through those different generations, the GGPs, the GP, the, the PFs. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how many generations it took to get the whole population uh, resistant to that, but what they did was they did multiple, multiple kind of male edits. Uh, so they produced, I don't know what it was, I think 10 or 20 of them, and it took them two or three generations to really kind of blow that population up. What's interesting is that recently uh, I heard that they sold some of those germline edited kind of boars into China. So the Chinese will now have like the resistance to PERS uh, at the low, low price of $1 million, I think, for, for 10 boars or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, it takes time to, to blow it all up, for sure. Anything else? So what improvements can we expect to see four years from now? Four years from now? Uh, I think you're looking at improvements more so focused on, you know, feed conversion ratio, livability. Uh, I think that's the way kind of it's going uh, in this part of the world. But again, there are different pure lines, there are different commercial products for, for different growers. I think there are, you know, the butterballs of the world that are always going to slaughter at 50 plus pounds, and you have to have pure line genetics that are aimed at that corridor, and you have to have pure line genetics that are aimed at the, the 45 pound corridor uh, that are higher live, you know, better feed conversion. So I think, uh, I think you can expect good things, but it depends on what kind of product that you want to buy. All right, thank you guys so much.